My name is Eric Neuberger. I am uh, your Census Bureau in action. And uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I really want to talk about this. Uh, I've been listening to, to what's been going on at this conference. A lot of great stuff. Very impressive. Uh, yesterday, today. And uh, but the, there is a question which has been mulling in my mind. And it is simply, who is data visualization for? Uh, for those grammarians in the audience, there are probably some, perhaps I should be saying, for whom is data visualization, but uh, be that as it may. Uh, but I find, I actually found in, in preparing this talk during the last 48 hours that um, uh, having listened to everyone and having realized you've all, you all know everything that you, I could possibly tell you, uh, but there is one thing, uh, and it's about this question, and it's really uh, it's a little different for a Census Bureau person to come out and speculate publicly. We're officially prohibited from doing that. So this is my census badge. I'm turning in my badge. <laughs> Gone. This is my calculator. It's like, you know, the cops turn in your badge and your gun in the, in the movies and they said, I'm about to go rogue. That's right. Okay. so. Uh, who is data visualization for? That's the question I want to talk about, and we'll get to it. There's a couple of things I got to. Uh, you got to see a title slide. So, data visualization perils and promises. Uh, a, a suggestion for the use of data visualization in education. Actually, it's a suggestions for the use of data visualization in education. Perhaps that's something I should correct before. All right. Uh, so it, here's a nice example. Let's go straight to the films. We have here islands of high income. Uh, what it actually is is an interactive data visualization which gives you access to the American Community Survey data by county on median household income. Now, that turns out to be a big deal in a couple of ways. Uh, what you're actually seeing here is the simplest possible interactive visualization that you can imagine. Uh, you have a little slider at the bottom and what you're doing is the further up you go, the higher the level you have to have in your median household income in the county to uh, basically be green. So right now, the slider's all the way at the bottom, so everybody's got 18,000 or more. So, okay, so everybody's green. But if we go up to around 72,000, we find the islands of high income. These are the areas in the nation with a very, and the archipelago of the Northeast Corridor, right? Uh, and, and these are, this is a huge deal, because these data, these 3,141 different numbers, right? are located in 3,141 different tables. Each one has a county name and then a bunch of characteristics by county. So if you wanted to make, if you wanted to get this picture, this understanding, this insight, this analysis, you would have to pull 3,141 tables and then you would have to find a way to put them together basically into this map because there's no other way it's going to happen. You cannot read 3,141 tables. It's absolutely impossible. Can't be done not with any insight, not with any understanding, but by simply putting it in the simplest possible interactive visualization, boom, suddenly we have understanding. Suddenly we have analytical content. And we can move that slider down. We call it islands of high income. We like to think positive, but uh, if you move that slider down to 32,000, now everything's green who's above 32,000 and the gray is what remains. These are areas that have median household income below 32,000. These are your archipelagos of low income. This is an analytical, this is an, this is an analysis that is literally unavailable essentially in any other format on the Census Bureau. Uh, you got to go here. All right, so uh, the Census Bureau is on a mission. It is a data visualization mission. This has been my job for the last three years. I've been with the Census Bureau since 97. Um, I've been uh, in a lot of different analytical areas, but right now I'm in the Communications Directorate. And what I've been doing for the Communications Directorate, there's a lot of stuff with, with metrics and customer experience management, but mostly it's been about uh, trying to get uh, the d data visualization of the Census Bureau. We've been trying to have the Census Bureau do more with pictures. Uh, and our, our mission is to increase the ratio of graphics to text in Census Bureau publications, both online and in print. And the reason for that is to open our data sets and analyses to a broader public. Because if it's in 3,141 tables, you ain't going to get it. And I don't care if you know how to pull 3,141 tables and put it together for yourself. First of all, there aren't very many of you who do that. And second of all, it's a pain and you shouldn't have to do that. Th 
the graphic makes it available. It makes it available to a much broader audience, and that's what we want to do. We serve the taxpayer. There are a lot of taxpayers in this nation. Uh, there are, I could tell you how many economists there are. I've got those numbers. I could tell you how many sociologists there are. I've got those numbers. Basically, beyond that, it, it, it doesn't amount to the number of taxpayers. We want to serve a broader audience. All right. And, uh, and all of this is coming from American Fact Finder. American Fact Finder is where we have the 1990 census short and long form, the 2000 census short and long form, the 2010 census, the ACS, American Community Survey, which is the successor to the long form, the, uh, the new economic census, when it comes out from 2012, will be going up here. Those are going to be coming out real soon. Population estimates are there. Lots of geographies. When you cross all the geographies by all the variables, by all the different cuts, uh, and now I'm going to include the numbers that I know are going in uh, to, from the econ census. Does anybody know what that number presently is? How many, how many individual estimates are on American Fact Finder? It's a collection of tables. How many table cells are there? Somebody guess. <laughs> Millions. Yes, that is true. How many? But can we say 10 million, right? More than that. I need, I need more than 10 million. 120 million. I got 120 million. Can I get more? There, 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 more, more, more. I get, you got to, you got to, oh, 600, more, more. A trillion. A not quite yet. But uh, as of the publication of the econ census, we will, well, right now it's about 380 billion with a B estimates. And when we publish the econ census, it's going to blow past that way past that. I'm not even sure how much yet. I think we'll be around 420, but I'm not positive. I need to check that. So it is literally a pile of data that unless you know exactly what you're looking for, you're not getting it. Because it's 400 and some odd billion estimates. And most of them have confidence intervals associated with it, so you can double that number. I mean, good God, man, woman, whoever. Good God, it's, just, it's huge. So um, we've got to make this available to a broader audience. Now, we used to actually be good at this. This is 1870. This is the front page of the Statistical Atlas of the United States. And we'd, there was this new technology. It was called lithography. And you could do all kinds of you know, pictures on a mass scale. And we suddenly were able to make, you know, use uh, maps in series to show the growth of the West Coast. We could use. Uh, there's trellis diagrams, and we could use mosaic plots like this one, and we could use data in multiples, you know, small multiples, like Tufty talks about all the time, uh, with different visual metaphors for different types of data. This is a whole data set on a page. You could spend hours studying this and learn enormous things about the United States in 1870. It was really, really great. We beat the band. Uh, we had slope diagrams with ranking tables, and we had, I particularly like this one. This is a radar plot, but it, it's a radar plot that actually makes sense because it's a cycle. It is the cycle of death. This is, the, this is deaths in the United States in, in, in 1890. And you can see starting June, July, August, you can see how uh, people die in winter. It was bad. And they didn't really recover until May, June. And one of the things I particularly, and it is a cycle, so it's round, so that makes sense. It's an appropriate use of a visual metaphor. And I particularly like also that it has June at the top and December at the bottom, rather than January at the top. Because of course, the solstices and the equinoxes, because it's a clock. <laughs> All right. Um, but what happened? That was 1890, the pinnacle of Census Bureau graphing. Then what happens? Well, this thing happened. This is the, in 1890, this is the, the Hollerith tabulating machine. The Hollerith tabulating machine was an analog computer. Some people say it's, no, it's just a computational machine. Well, it's a computational machine. It's, a computer. it's an analog computer. It was an electronic counting device, an electronic tabulating machine, and it allowed us to, to process the 1890 census way faster than we had the 1880 census. The 1880 census took us eight years to come out with the numbers because we were doing everything by hand. It was the age of the quill pen, when movable type was a big deal. Um, the, but 1880, you know, eight years, the, the, way the, sense, the, the way the country was growing, by the time we came out with the results, they were already invalid. But uh, we used them anyway. It's what we had. 1890 took us two years because we used that machine, and we did it twice to make sure the numbers were right. All right. Uh, but the thing was, it was a tabulating machine, which meant what it spat out was tables. And suddenly, everything we had started to look like that for about 100 years. 
we had um, and, and, and because you had reduced the cost of the, you have re significantly reduced the cost of calculation, you could do more calculation than you ever could before. You could get to those crisscrosses, those analyses that were just too expensive. It was going to take me too much time. I know how long it takes me to create that graphic. It was going to take too long. Now you could do it. And we produced through 20th, the 20th century, we produced amazing tables. And what they really are is multidimensional data sets in paper form. And they're great, but they're tables. And the ultimate expression is an American fact finder, more than 400 billion estimates in one place. All right. So we got to get back to the 1890s. That's what I'm saying. And so we started with, um, we're going to party like it's 1895. Um, <laughs> We started uh, with uh, 2010. When we released the 2010 numbers, we actually came out with an interactive graphic for them. Oh my god! It had layers that had population change, population density. This is the apportionment layer. You're looking at state. You're looking at, so you've got geography. You've got time, the two most important contexts there are, geography and time. They're both here. Uh, we're looking at analytical content, the proportion in 20, the, the, and this is the number of people per representative for this particular state. And you, it just, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, this one you might be interested in. We're not just doing interactives. We're trying to do all kinds of graphics. This is a short form infographic, which we call a news graphic. These are designed, and once again, remember, who are, you know, who is data visualization for? Keep it in mind. What's that question? This one is for uh, news organizations. We, we're trying to provide art to go on the front page. We hope the front page. Uh, this one in particular you might be interested in. This is showing uh, degree versus employment for people uh, who got a STEM degree. So we're looking at employed people, and we're saying, uh, for those who went into science and engineering uh, as an undergrad, what was their college major, and what occupation are they in now? And you can see the different majors, and you can see, you know all that gray? Those are people who are not in STEM fields. The dark green are people who are in STEM occupations. The light green are people who are in STEM-related nurses, doctors, that sort of thing. Um, you can see biology is very heavily in that one. Biology majors, a lot of them go pre, are pre-med. Uh, but when you look at uh, engineering, first of all, the most science and, and engineering degrees are actually in the social sciences. Uh, but then after that, you look at engineering, and only about half of engineers are, or half of trained engineers are becoming engineers. So, you know, I, I'm hearing a lot about how we need to train more engineers, and it seems to me, I don't know if we need to train more so much as find a way to make it worth their while, because they're not doing it. Uh, the same thing for computer majors that you see a little bit lower down. Uh, we're doing long form infographics as well. This one I'm particularly proud of. Uh, this is actually showing uh, the, the sort of blue squares are the number of people who have served during wartime in the United States. Those are the numbers of soldiers. And the white squares inside are the numbers who died doing it. For every war from the Civil War to present day. I hope somebody said, wow, yeah. Yeah, this is one you can spend some time on. And then the infographic within the, in, within the infographic is our look uh, using the American Community Survey, the red stuff, to look at where are the, the veterans from those periods today and what are they, uh, some characteristics about them. We did this for Memorial Day last year. Uh, you can look all this stuff up online. You should. It's fascinating. Um, I have a plane to catch, so I'm moving on. We have, um, uh, we have this uh, population density profile of the I-95 corridor, and this is an animation. It's not really interactivity, but it does, because it's animated, it adds emotional content. You start in Miami, and you push the button, and you see just a little dot move up the coasts as it goes up I-95. And what you see is within two miles of I-95 on either side, the population density at each point. So this is a way of looking at the Northeast Corridor of driving up the coast, the top down, <laughs> seeing the big buildings, and then seeing some places where there's no people. Mostly, you're seeing big buildings. Um, uh, but again, this is, we're, we're using whatever visualizations we can to try to get our data out and more accessible. These are obviously population data, but in a different form, to give people an understanding, right? This is where the Northeast, why the Northeast Corridor is called the Northeast Corridor. All right, um, a lot of this that we're doing, we have to, we, we justify this uh, based on uh, Neuberger's hypothesis of data visualization. Uh, and this is where uh, I, I'm trying to sum up for the people in the building why this all works and why this is a good idea. And so I have this hypothesis, and it goes like this. You got cognitive loading, which is how much it takes to read a display, and then you have understanding, 
which is how much you will actually understand from that display. And I think that the relationship looks a lot like that. I think it's, it's negatively correlated, and I think it's nonlinear. I think if you can go from A, where you have a high cognitive load, I think you're going to have very little understanding. And if you can reduce that cognitive load, I think you can up understanding considerably of what's behind it. Ultimately, if you can make people stop seeing the visualization, then they'll understand. If you can make the visualization disappear and the reality that it represents alive in their mind, you've won. Now, uh, cognitive loading, here's the, the functional part of Neuberger's hypothesis is the cognitive loading scale. Uh, you know, light stuff at the top, pre-attentive understanding, natural visual metaphors, icons, you can read about all that stuff in the literature and I don't need to go into it for you and I don't have time anyway. Uh, but the thing, all, all the way down to stuff that outright fools your eyes with a heavy, heavy loading at the bottom. And this is the cognitive, it's 12 things that you can put in a visualization. I can't think of anything else besides these 12. Everything I've seen falls into one of these 12. And here's the thing. The managers in my building need to be able to look at their employees and say, that sucks. What you just handed me sucks. And most importantly, it's not my opinion that what you handed me sucks. There's this scale over here that says <laughs> there's this cognitive loading thing. And I can see that you're using words or numbers in ordered groups. OK, that's all right. But you've also got equations and jargon in there. And if you don't lose the equations and jargon, it's too high a, cogn too high a cognitive load. So it sucks. You've got to fix it. Uh, because the managers need it. Because there's a lot of, in this visualization stuff, you start doing, people start saying, well, that's just your opinion. I think it's pretty. I don't care. If you think it's pretty, I care if it's effective. And so this is a functional hypothesis, purely functional. That's all we're after here. Um, and I needed something to hand the managers to, so they could tell their employees that stuff sucked. All right, um, but you do have to do it the right way. So for example, um, all right, you see the circles in the middle of the other circles, the circle in the middle of the big circles, and the circle in the middle of the little circles? Everybody knows it's a trick, but which one looks bigger? The one, on the, the one surrounded by the little circles looks bigger, right? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's not. They're both exactly the same size. But there's this interference that happens. We are terrible. Our eyes are terrible at judging areas. Our eyes know that they are terrible at judging areas, but they don't tell you that. What they do instead is when you're presented with a lot of interference and clutter and, and two things that you're trying to judge the size of, what you do instead is you judge the size of the thing it's next to. So the one next to the little ones looks big, and the one next to the big one looks little. That's just the way it works. And yet people make visualizations that look like that. You can see that that might be a bad idea. Even worse, considering the underlying data here are actually a time series, they could have just done this. I think that's easier to read. I think it has a lower cognitive load. All right. Um, uh, you also have to be careful not just to make things that your eyes can read, but you, you do know we are pattern-forming creatures. You've all seen these before. You see the triangle, even though we know there's no triangle there. There's just three Pac-Men having a conversation. Um, you see the worm going around the pole, even though it's just two commas. You see the cones that are actually not cones. They're strangely shaped triangles, and they're not around a sphere. There is no sphere. And of course, the Loch Ness Monster doesn't exist. So we're pattern-forming creatures, and we'll find them. But it's even worse than that we'll find patterns that aren't there. We will even assign agency to things. Now, don't you, can't you just imagine how that poor strawberry in front is imagining what the three are talking about? They're, they're talking about, they're strawberries. They're not having a conversation, and the one in front doesn't have any thoughts. They're pieces of fruit. But we assign agency, right? We assign agency. We see patterns, even when it's not there. You have to be careful when you create visualizations because of this, these facts. And, there's, and by the way, there's a good reason that we are pattern-seeking and assign agency. Did everybody just get a chill? Stripes. All right, you survive. Let's try it again, different picture. Did everybody get a chill that time? Oh, yeah. If you are in the forest, and you are a hominid, and you see this, you do not stick around to investigate and see if it's what you think it is. You just run, and then you live. And if you run when it was just you know a bush or something like that, you're OK. You got some exercise. 
But if you don't run, if you do the double take thing, you're lunch. We evolved to see agency in the dark. We evolved to see patterns, to find them quickly and react to them. And you got to keep that in mind when you're creating visualizations. This is important. Um, uh, now, there are people who are doing a lot of work on making sure that we can, do the, we can try to avoid that sort of thing. This is Bill Cleveland's work. He's got his scale. I have my scale. He's got his scale. His has a lot more research work behind it than mine. Um, but uh, anyway, these are graphical features which are uh, highly efficient or less efficient in conveying information. There's a lot of work, by the way, on how to avoid making false patterns. And there's a lot of work on how to uh, make things have a low cognitive load. There's very little work on, assign, on, on dealing with the agency problem, by the way. Um, uh, but yeah, and we got to have the math right. This is a graphic that the Census Bureau published uh, recently on the proportion of people, uh, or the proportion of households with a computer in them and the proportions with the internet. Um, and does anybody see the problem? It's a huge problem. Look at the x-axis. Notice how everything's equally spaced, but we didn't collect the data every year. We collect the data occasionally. This is how the graphic should have been done, where the spacing is proportional to when you, and the reason it should have been done that way is because what we're really trying to get to is this. We're trying to get that rate of change. The angle represents the rate of change. It's change over time, right? Height versus, and the slopes are wrong when you crunch everything together like that. You get this line, which if you draw them together, they're very different lines. And if you're someone who's taking the data and you're trying to estimate when it is that the computer market is going to be topped out and you need to sell, uh, the difference between these two lines can be very important for you. So we need to, we, you need to get the math right. And, and another thing is you need to, all right, look at this one a nice gentle increase in computer ownerships per household. It's the same data set again. And then check this one out. Look how fast it's going. Exactly the same data set. I just stretched it to emphasize the growth. Now as an analyst, the math in both of these is exactly the same. The math in both is right. But the meaning that we get from it can be different. And the only way to know which one is right is to be an analyst and have an analytical opinion about which one it, it is. Was it fast or was it slow? If you think it was fast, you do it this way. If you think it was slow, you do it the other way. That is an analytical choice that you have to be willing to make it. You've got to be a good analyst. All right. Oh, and by the way, um, correlation and causation, there is a problem there. Uh, this shows the imports of fresh lemons from United States to Mexico on the x-axis, and the y-axis is, is traffic fatalities. And the title of this graphic, these are real data, the title of this graphic is Mexican Lemons Save American Lives. <laughs> now, these are real data, but I assure you, I, I don't really think that conclusion is, is, is I think that might be, it's possible it's a spurious correlation. Um, and and in, in particular, because I'm looking at 96 through 2000, I know this is 2014, I'm thinking, and we have these data going way back, so I'm thinking someone looked at the data set, wanted to make a joke, and they picked the five years when the things were running in the same direction by coincidence. That's my hypothesis which explains this graphic. And you do have to have an explanation, because there's a funny thing about correlation and causation. Correlation may not mean causation, but if it doesn't, you got some explaining to do. Because we think it does. Because when I put this up, everyone, probably you, sitting in your seats right there, even before I explained it, you're looking at it and you're trying to figure out why that would make sense. <laughs> Isn't that right? You were saying, well, maybe there's something about Mexican trucks being safer. Maybe it's not about lemons so much as imports overall. Maybe it's a stand-in for imports. Maybe it's, no, no, it's a spurious correlation. I faked it. Well, I didn't. Somebody else did, but I'm taking credit for it. Um, and that that's a problem because we are naturally pattern-seeking creatures and we want to believe patterns that we find. We just do. What you see is all there is. You put it on a page and that's all there is. We believe what we see. We were hearing this yesterday, right? All right, so uh, who is data visualization for, specifically in education? Well, so far, that's what we've been hearing, right? We've been hearing about administrators, 
at finding very, very useful. We've been hearing about teachers finding it extremely useful. We've been hearing about parents, students a little bit. Students we've been hearing about, they're going to learn about their path. They're going to learn about how to, how to pick the right courses, how to choose the right college, where they might be appropriate, what interests there are. That's all great. And by the way, that is all great. I, I'm really in favor of that. I think that's all terrific. But it is, it's not what gets me excited, and it's not what I was thinking about when everybody was talking about all that stuff. When I got invited to the conference, what I was really thinking is about this other thing. All right. Um, this is the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, uh, taken from the air. And it's a river in uh, Chesapeake Bay. It's a lovely place. You should go there sometime. And uh, they've got old growth forests, and they've got maritime, and they've got, you know, they've got marshes and water. And it's, it's a terrific place. And they had this education program. And they asked, I, I, I was visiting, and I was, was going to volunteer there. And I walked around to see who needed a statistician. And the person who really needed the statistician was the guy running the education program. Because he said, look, we've got these kids coming in from junior high school and high school, and we're, we're, having them, we're giving them scientific instruments. This was a few years ago when you still needed to do that. We're giving them scientific instruments. We're having them try to do real science. We'd like them to do real science. We think they can, but the results have been very poor because they don't have the analytical skill set. They just, it's not there. They don't have the statistics. Perhaps you could teach them statistics. And I said, Okay, I can take that on. Um, how much time are you going to give me? And he said, well, I could give you, say, one night, three hours. And I said, you want me to teach all of statistical analysis in three hours? And he said, yes. And I said, okay. <laughs> and um, it turns out I can teach all of statistical analysis in three minutes. So can you. It's actually pretty easy. It goes like this. All of statistical analysis boils down to just three questions. That's the first of them. You have to ask how big it is, how tall, how short, how fast, how small, whatever it is. How big is it? You've got to have quantities. You've got to be measuring something or you're not going to be doing statistics. It's just the way it works. All right. So we've, we start with how big it is. But actually, nobody cares about that first question. We at the Census, oh. At the Census Bureau, we care about that question a lot. We spend all of our time on it. <laughs> we really, really care to make sure the numbers are right. Nobody else really cares if the numbers are right. What everybody else really cares about is the second question. What difference does it make? They want to know what it means. I'll prove it to you, too. If I tell you that the GDP of the United States last year was $10 billion, it wasn't. It was like 16, 17, something. But it is, if it's $10 trillion, what on earth can you do with that number? You can do nothing with that number. There's nothing you can do. But if I tell you that this year it's 10.5 trillion, 5% growth in the United States, that's, that's full employment. That's everybody's happy. That's, that's amazing. You care even more if I tell you this year's 9.5 trillion, 5% loss, which would be a calamity. We've been through something that wasn't quite that bad recently. It was pretty bad. Um, so you care a lot about what difference does it make. That, that comparison is important. And if you can find out what those And then there's the third question where all the math usually comes in, which is, and are you sure that's not just dumb luck? <laughs> yeah, all right, the statisticians are laughing. They know it's true. Uh, we, we try to figure out whether that could have ha just happened, right? Is there some other explanation, right? And so if you can answer these three questions in any way, you are doing a statistical analysis. Usually, we take a lot of math to answer these three questions, especially question three. But I believe, and I think I've been able to show, that um, you can use a picture. And I wasn't the first one who came up with that. Everybody knows Snow's cholera map, right? So Broad Street pump, cholera. I don't have a germ theory of disease, but I am going to figure out that water is causing cholera. Somehow, it's passing through the water. And the way I'm going to figure it out is by answering the three questions. First question, how big is it? How many people died? I got that represented on this map. Every tip mark is a death. And then the second question, what difference does it make? Well, I put the Broad Street pump right in the, I put the pump locations around, and the ones close to the Broad Street pump tended to die. And the ones who were far away lived. So that's a big difference. It matters. And then the third question, are you sure that's not just dumb luck? Well, he did an outlier analysis. He found the areas that were far away from the Broad Street pump where people had died, and he figured out those people were walking through Broad Street every day and probably were drinking the water. And he went to the places that were close to the Broad Street pump, like the, the, the workhouse and the brewery, where they weren't drinking the water, and they were living. 
you know, at the, at the brewery, they were fine because they weren't drinking the water from the pump. And so we had these positive outliers, negative outliers. I don't think it's just dumb luck, it's the water. So every statistical analysis boils down to that, and it doesn't have to be math. So I spent three hours talking to these kids about the nature of using pictures to answer questions, answer scientific questions using a statistical analysis. And the results were pretty good. And the results were bound to be pretty good. You know about ANSCOM's quartets? These four data sets that uh, Tukey's brother-in-law came up with, John Tukey, the founder of all modern data visualization, his brother-in-law. He, he wanted to make the point that, you know, summary statistics are not always that helpful. Here are four different data sets, different pairs. Of, you know, it's, they're just small, 11. You know, but here is the average, the mean, of all the x's and the y's. Nine point, okay, so 9 and 7.5. 9 and 7.5, 9 and 7.5, and 9 and 7.5. Oh, well, let's take a look at, uh, well, how about the variance? Yeah, those are identical as well. What about, uh, what if I look at the correlation between x and y? Yeah. What if I look at the regression equation? Let's go that way. Yeah, it's the same for all of them, out to three digits. You actually can't tell the difference between these data sets by statistical procedure. There are statistical procedures you can do to, to learn the difference between them, but I did not learn those statistical procedures until very late in my undergraduate career, and it was only because I was working as a grad student at the time for a professor. This is what they look like if you graph them. They're clearly very different. You talk about finding outliers, they are outliers. You talk about finding different patterns varying around uh, a line versus curvilinear versus curve or versus linear uh, with outliers. They're, the differences are obvious and you see them in an instant. In fact, you can't not see them. This was ANSCOM's uh, proof that, uh, you know, maybe summary statistics are great, but maybe we should be spending more time making pictures. Well, this is Bill Cleveland's data. And or actually not Bill Cleveland's data. This is an analysis he was doing in his graphing book. And he was writing in uh, the late 80s and the early 90s a book on how to do graphics, statistical graphics. And he took a data set that every statistician who had published a book on statistics for years and years and years uh, had looked at. And, and he, he looked at it and he graphed it. And in about two seconds, he saw this. He saw that in the Morris area, and don't even worry what the data are about. It doesn't matter. In the Morris area, the num the, the the dots are flipped around. Everybody else has one on one, you know, has the red on one side and the blue on the other, and then everybody else, it's flipped. And he looked at it every way he could, and the suggestion, he, he believes, there was a recording error in the original data set back in 1932. They just, they flipped the 1931 and 1932, and a lot of people have looked at this and they think he's right. This data set had been examined with every conceivable statistical process between 1932 and 1991 because it was used as the data set for every statistical textbook and no one found it until he made a picture. So I really do believe that the analytical capabilities provided by visualization are intense and are learnable by very young people. So there were these two kids Right? I did this a few times, and one time it was just two kids, it was in the summer, and we went out and we were going to do an experiment. I'd given them the three hours and we were going to go do an experiment. And so we went out with the net and they're going to collect fish. And, and so the, you take the net and you just pull it to the shore, it's very high tech. And then you, you take the fish and you, you put the fish in buckets and you count them. That's the whole experiment. But you're also looking for, for and the two, the two fish they were interested in were each, this is the white perch on the one side, and then the uh, uh, the uh, oh, pumpkin seed on the other side. And uh, they're both good fish. They, they have sort of different life cycles, but they're about the same size, and they're both tasty, by the way. Um, and and they're, they're common enough, and they're near shore, and so you can get them. And so we, we collected them. But what we were really looking for was this guy. This is an isopod. It's a gill parasite. And what it does is it attaches to the gill, and it sucks the lifeblood out of these fish for as long as the fish survives. Everybody's going, yeah, imagining having the thing. Yeah, it's really, but you've got to imagine it's actually inside your lungs, which would be even worse because this is on their gills. All right, so we're counting gill parasites. This is what they look like. They're actually pretty obvious. Let me blow that up for you. You actually see them sticking out of the gills. And yes, it is very much a sort of alien, yeah, kind of thing when it happens. But um, so we count, and then we just, how many white perch 
did we collect with and without parasites? And then I said, while you're collecting, I want you to measure their length. We're going to use their length as a stand-in for how old they are, because let's get an additional characteristic, because I'm from the Census Bureau, so I think about demography all the time. And so we did that, and then we did some bar charts. And those did not work, because they are just not that informative. We needed to change that around. Two seconds later, we had this form. We said, well, you know, what if we controlled for the different numbers of fish that we caught and made it all in percentage terms? So the top set of bars is for the overall pop, and then the bottom sets of bars are broken out by age, older and younger, or big, small. You see anything different there? In case you need help. <laughs> Can anybody not see the difference? Can you avoid seeing the difference? And the, the, the question was, why is this happening? Why is it that in the one, you've got equal proportions of small and big? I mean, overall, it's, it's very, very close. It's about 40% of the fish had, had gill parasites. But when you, when you broke it out, you found out that in the white perch, you had about equal old and young being infected. But in the pumpkin seeds, it didn't happen until later in life. Two interpretations. One, all the young pumpkin seeds that get infected get eaten. But considering there are actually more pumpkin seeds than white perch, we were thinking it might be something <coughs> more interesting. And I, I, I was talking to them, and I said, you know, you've really found something here. We know these fish have different life cycles. So the next step, the next experiment, would be to look at their different life cycles and figure out what part of the water column are they in where they're being infected. Because if the young white perch are in a different place than the young pumpkin seeds, and the young pumpkin seeds have some sort of protection, I think we might actually learn something about the life cycle of the isopod, and maybe we could do something about them or at least understand how they're going to impact the population over time. And do I have to tell you that their eyes lit up? And the one looked at me. Well, they, they were packing up to go. This, I mean, this took quite a while, and we, we finished. And they're packing up to go. And, and I just realized that clock is actually broken. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they're packing up to go, as am I. And, and the, one, the one girl turns. She runs, and she says, wait, Mom. And she comes back, and she says, and she asked me the best question anyone has ever asked me in my life. She looked me straight in the eye and she said, are we the only ones who know this? <laughs> what can I say? I told her to be careful driving home. <laughs> um, now, this moment when I realized that and by the way, one of the only times in my life when you know, the moment came and I actually had that answer. I didn't think of it later. I actually had it at the time. Um, but that, that moment when I realized, what, what it taught me was these kids, and I'd been noticing this, and we were hearing about this yesterday with, with uh, Chris Deed from Harvard. What, he's having them simulate science, and it's exciting for them. These kids were actually doing actual, real science. And what they were really doing they were doing something real. We don't let kids work. We isolate them from people who are doing work, except teachers. They get to see that happen. We, they have, you know, I was lucky. I was 14. I was in the family business. I, I, know what work, I knew what work looks like pretty early on, and I wasn't as bored as a lot of my friends. These kids had been given an insight or a, a taste of the grown up where you can actually change the world world. Yesterday, we also heard, he said, you know, these kids, they think they can change the world. I'm here to tell you. Give them data visualization. They can. The missing piece, look, okay, you know what that is? That's a picture of the Earth, the curvature of the Earth taken from about 100,000 uh, feet, which was take, that picture was taken by this kid and his classmates, who's he's like 12, right, who got a, a weather balloon and about $200 in parts, packed them with a, a digital camera, which he programmed to go click, click every 45 seconds. And he launched it into the stratosphere, tracked it with his iPad. Oh, sorry. Tracked it with his iPad, right? So when it was coming down, he's tracking its location. The whole thing was about a five-hour flight. And he's got NASA quality stuff from 30 years ago, right? 200 bucks in parts and an iPhone. And you've got the, the, the technology that kids have access to is extraordinary. And he's not the only one who have done this. In Canada, they sent a man into space. Um, in England, they sent one of the Burger King Whoppers. 
Uh, you know, th this is something to do now. It's kind of kicky. It's kind of fun. I, yeah, I, I took a picture of space. They are touching outer space with the things that they carry in their pockets all the time, right? We've got a simplified view of a smartphone. It's got an accelerometer, a gyrometer, an electronic compass, pressure sensors. It's got recording equipment for both sound and visuals. It's got, it, you know where it is all the time. It can take a date stamp, a time stamp, a position down to a few square feet. There's actually a, an app where you can turn it into the tricorder that it, it, it now looks like the tricorder it actually is, right? And so we've got kids walking around with advanced scientific gear in their pockets all the time. $10 in equipment and you've got a microscope that's of a quality that can do this, a little bit of a, a, a this and you, you, you put a lens on it and now you can take a picture of the moons of Jupiter and then you can use uh, filtering software and you can get an actually high quality image of Jupiter with your cell phone. The kids have access to, this is the internet in 2010, 4.2 billion unique internet addresses, right? The, the biggest library in the history of the world. Kids have access to, this is just data.gov. These are the subjects that are there. Freely available data. They can understand the things in their world in every conceivable facet. And it's not, they don't have to work alone either. They've all got 500 Facebook friends. <laughs> They can set up a network for themselves, for data collection. How long? You can have large-scale data sets very rapidly. The ANSCOM quartets are 11 digits, or 11, 11 records long, and you can look at them, and you can read them and see that they're different. What if it's 11,000 records? You need an analytical, computational, powerful thing to do that. <coughs> Every computer that's sold today has software sufficient for a data set of that size. You don't have to get anything to go on it. It's already there. The visualizations are there if they can understand how to make the visualizations. It only takes about three hours to get them trained up. We could be, yeah. look, I'm talking to educators. You already know all this and it all sounds great, but I'm here to say data visualization, it really is that missing link in this whole chain. They've got the data sources. They've got the data collaborators. They need a way to think about and analyze what they have. And I see that data visualization can really be that because it lowers cognitive load. And it's not every, it's not every analytical thing you can do, but it is enough to do real science today. And that's all I really wanted to talk about. Thank you. <laughs>